All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Casey Childers with Don't in three, two, one. It starts with a key ring. There's something like a thousand keys on it, one for every lock in the estate. It's mostly doors, but at least a dozen of them open strong boxes full of money and jewels. There are rooms upon rooms upon rooms, so many that it would take weeks to explore them with any sort of thoroughness. The closets have closets, the cellars have cellars, the parlors have parlors, the foyers have foyers. The place is so spectacularly large that the servants have servants and even the rats and mice can't breed fast enough to sufficiently infest it. So of course you're bored with everything by the fourth week and of course the only key of the thousand that interests you in the slightest is the one to the little door just beyond the sub pantry of the sub kitchen in the east wing. The little gold key that was pointed out against the myriad others by your new husband as the one key which was never ever ever to be used. For a while, you just sort of finger it in your pocket. It's easy to find, like a loose tooth, irresistible. There's something about the shape that draws your hand over and over, the way the edges feel against your skin. It's a disappointing marriage, but this key, it's sort of everything you've ever wanted. The more you touch it, the more you know you have to know. The more you find yourself wandering the ground floor in the east wing, digging for snacks in the pantry, feeling the pull of the little door just past the piled sacks of potatoes. The kitchen staff asks if they can whip something up for you. It's really nothing at all, they say. Spending most days as they do, planning grand menus for gatherings that'll never happen. No, you say, don't trouble yourselves. I'm not sure what I want. Maybe it's best I just poke around on my own for a bit. Nobody would blame you if you put an ear to the door. Just one ear, set your hand against the cold oak. Nobody would blame you for touching the brass handle, feeling it, the texture of its Italian craftsmanship. And if it were to give, if it were unlocked to begin with, and through no fault of your own, you were to accidentally push down with too much force and the door were to swing wide, well, your oath to not use the key would remain intact. And besides, the door is locked and there's no crime in testing a handle. Likewise, there's no crime in looking through a keyhole either. The privacy afforded by keyholes isn't your concern. How could it be? You're no mechanical engineer. You're a young wife with a ring full of keys, the mistress of a manor with every right to look through any keyhole she pleases. And besides, there's only darkness at the other side. If it is a test, and it feels a lot like a test, Maybe it's your not, not your fidelity. Maybe your new husband prefers tenacity to obedience, and to leave the door undisturbed is to break his heart. And it'd be a shame to let him down. He's not much to look at, but he has been generous. He's handed you the keys to the whole of his earthly wealth. Plus, the keys themselves are probably worth something on their own. And maybe you aren't blameless when the key goes in the door, but it was already set to happen long before you even knew you were part of the story. And every bit of the nervous energy in your muscles gives way to the exhilaration of a crime committed in the full consciousness. And the door creaks its creak, and before you know it, the don't ever has been done. And you fumble for the switch. Resorting to shining your phone on the wall, the floor is sticky. <laughs> Tugging at your heels as you shuffle clumsily around. And as you flip on the lights, you wonder what you'd expected to find in all those moments you'd spend hovering nearby. But it probably wasn't this. The body stacked just so, the heads off to the side in a stainless steel basin. The tools with which the heads were removed. There's a sense of order to the scene that briefly offsets the terror, a suggestion that registers somewhere in the, oh, he took a lot of time to arrange this room exactly the way he likes it. Long before it hits the, holy shit, there are a lot of dead women in this room, parts of your brain. And then you've arrived. From here out, there's no take backs. It was rigged from the start, and you played your part perfectly. There's no moral to the story. There's no you did the right thing, and you didn't look in the room, and he doesn't plan to kill you. There's no years later. You're both gray-haired and perfectly contented, and holding hands on his deathbed, you confide that in your younger days, you thought he was kind of creepy, and that his blue beard was straight up bizarre, to which he chuckles, confiding that his big secret was he'd kind of killed all of his past wives after they'd fallen into a little moral trap he'd set, and that... Though he'd toyed with the notion of killing you, you'd changed his mind with your earnest acceptance of his rules. There's an inch of coagulated blood on the floor. There are ropes and hooks and table saws and chains and jars upon jars of matted hair and gristle. This was always a horror room, an Ikea showroom of madness and cruelty with an intended audience of one. 
He would have gotten you in here one way or another in time. Weeks could have passed, months. Maybe he dropped more and more hints. Take trip after trip to follow up on business dealings in far-off lands. And don't go getting any ideas about that forbidden room of mine, he'd say. And if you were to remain steadfast in your avoidance, if you began to see the pathetic game for what it was, he'd eventually just leave the door cracked. A little at first and then a lot, and ultimately after a big melodramatic show of frantically digging through the couch cushions, he'd tell you outright to go in there with something like, hey, can you go see if I left my wallet on the workbench in that room I told you to keep out of while I checked the upstairs bathroom? You were always meant to see this, to experience an unending moment of realization that before long you'd be in here with the rest of the rotten meat to be discovered by the next curious wife to come snooping around, to feel his eyes on your back as he said from the far end of the pantry. I was really hoping you wouldn't see that. <laughs> if there's a lesson in any of it, it's maybe not to be born poor, or maybe not to be born a woman, or maybe not to be born at all, but it's too late for that. You're here, and the victims at your feet are clear enough indication of what comes of waiting patiently for your punishment. If he just left you to wander the house without warning, it's entirely possible you never would have even found this room, but that option wasn't on the table. Sure, the don't, your scripted reaction to it may be the only reason you're standing here, but of all the do's in the story, do marry the noble rich man. Uh, do marry, honor your husband. Do what you like so long as it's not this. That particular do not is the only reason you stand a chance because you're living with a fucking serial killer. And it was gonna come up eventually. And this is no time to kick yourself and wish you'd just stuck to counting the flatware or exploring the hedge mazes with your sister. You're neck deep in the after don't now. And all that matters is what you do or don't do next because the iron gates at the edge of the world are opening for the monster's return to his den and no amount of repenting or following the rules can save you from the evil he means to do. Thank you. <laughs>